after um, you um, let go of a lot of stuff, obviously Twitter became slimmed down a lot, and then you started making some more policy decisions. One of those policy decisions was to bring Donald Trump back. He hasn't actually tweeted yet. Right. Uh, do you expect him to come back at any point? Like, have you have you spoken to him? I haven't spoken to him. Uh, I don't know. He may or may not come back. Uh, the, but the, but the point is that uh, Twitter should be uh, a town square that or, that is uh, gives uh, equal voice to you know the the whole country and ideally the whole world. If in order for something to serve as a digital town square, it must uh, you know serve all people from all political persuasions, uh, provided it's legal. Um, so. You know, close to half the country uh, voted for Trump. Uh, I wasn't one of them. I voted for Biden. Um, but nonetheless, uh, you know, free speech is meaningless unless you allow people uh, you don't like to say things you don't like. Today we're going to talk about Elon Musk. He did an interview with the BBC, and a guy named James Clayton was the interviewer. Greg, why don't you tell us about the videos we're going to watch? First, this guy's been diagnosed with Asperger's, which today is not called Asperger's, but is autism spectrum disorder in the DSM. So we'll make sure we clear that up up front. We may say Asperger's just because we forget. So he's used to dealing with problems and he sees this guy or this situation as a problem. That's why he goes through and says, OK, well, what? how do we fix this problem? Tell me what the problems are. What are the problems you've had? Where did you where did these things happen for you? And I think he probably does this with people who are building those rockets for him and building those cars for him. He has the same style, the same style of conversation with him as he's breaking down the uh, information to get to the root of the problem and the things that, that cause problems for him. So I think that's what we're seeing. I, not as much as I see where you're saying it's a, it's a negotiation skill as well, because boy, is a smoking negotiation skill he's got there. But this is a, 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 pro, a problem solving situation, I think, is, is from my point of view. And you're right, Greg, that thing, that, that Trump thing where Trump does the, he does a little pointing thing and you pinpoint, that's when he pinpoints something important. And Musk does that here too, when he's pinpointing something, but it, he's bringing it toward himself. So it's, it's that introspective thing. He's trying to solve this problem. That's why I think, that's what I think is happening here. I think we're seeing a master problem solver solve a problem. And it just goes sideways for this guy and he can't get out of it. And it just, it just, wow, it's so, so bad for this guy. I don't feel sorry for him. He's asking for it. And they shouldn't have sent him in there because you, you don't send a, a mouse to do a, a rat's job. And that's what they've done. One of those tape replays. I mean, I would, I would only just add that, you know, we have spoken to people who, who have been sacked that used to be in content moderation. And, and we've spoken to people very recently who were involved in moderation. And they just say they just there's not enough people to police this stuff, particularly around um, particularly around hate speech um, in the company. Do, is that well, what hate that speech are you talking about? I mean, you use Twitter. Right. Do you see a rise in hate speech? I mean, I, I, but just a personal anecdote. Like, what do, do you? I don't. P personally, my uh, for you, I would see I get I get more of that kind of content. Yeah, personally. But I, I'm not going to talk to talk to the rest of for, for the rest of Twitter. So you but see more hate speech personally. I would say I would see more hateful content in that in that content probably. you don't like or or hateful. What do you mean to describe a hateful thing? Yeah, I mean, you know, just content that will solicit a, a reaction, something that may include something that is slightly racist or slightly sexist, those kinds of those kinds of things. So you think if I'm, something is slightly sexist, it should be banned? I, no, is that I'm what you're saying? I'm not saying anything. I'm saying. Well, I'm just curious. What you, I'm, just, I'm trying to understand what you mean by hateful con content. And I'm asking for specific examples. Um, and if, and you just said that if something is slightly sexist. That's hateful content. Does that mean that it should be banned? Well, you've asked me. You've asked me whether my feed, whether it's got less or more. It, I'd say it's got slightly more. That's what I'm asking for examples. Can, right. you, can you name one example? I, I honestly don't. You I, I, honestly, you I don't. You can't name I, a single example. I'll tell you why. Because I don't actually use that for you feed anymore. Because I, I just don't particularly like it. But you and said actually, a lot of people. A lot of people are quite similar. I, I, I only. Well, well, I only look well, at hang my, on a second. My you said you've seen more hateful content, but you can't name a single example. Not even one. I'm not sure I've used that feed for the last three or four weeks. And I. Well, then how did you see the hateful content? content? Because I've been I've been using I've been using Twitter since you've taken it over for the last six months. Okay, so then you must have at some point seen the you for you hateful content. I'm asking for one example. Right, and, and I, you can't I, give us a single I, one. And, I, and, I, and I'm saying, I, I, then I, I say so that you don't know what you're talking about. Really? Yes, because you can't give me a single example 
of hateful con uh, content, not even one tweet, and yet you claimed that the hateful content was high. Well, that's a false. No, what I claimed, you just lied. What no, no, what I claimed was. Uh, there are many uh, organizations that say that that kind of information is on the rise. Now, whether whether it has on my Give me feed one or example. not, I mean, I, right? And if you look at something one. like the, the uh, Strategic Dialogue uh, Institute in the, U in the UK, they will say that. So they, look, as people will say all sorts of nonsense. I'm literally asking for a right. single example, and you can't name one. Right. And as, as I've already said, I don't use that feed. But let's, well, then how would you know that? I don't you, think this is getting anywhere. You literally said you experienced more hateful content. And then couldn't name a single example. Right, and as I said, I that's absurd. I haven't, I haven't actually looked at that feed. I then how would you know this hateful content? Because I'm saying that's what I saw a few weeks ago. I can't give you an exact example. Let's move on. We have, we only have a certain amount of time. Um, well, wow. COVID misinformation. Well, wow. COVID misinformation. You changed the COVID, you changed the COVID misinformation. Has course. BBC changed this COVID misinformation? The BBC does not set the rules on Twitter, so I'm asking you. No, I'm talking about the BBC's misinformation about COVID. I'm, I'm, I'm literally Has asking you about, you changed the labels, the COVID misinformation labels. There used to be a policy, and then it then disappeared. Why, why do that? Well, COVID is no longer an issue. Does the BBC uh, hold itself at all responsible for misinformation re re regarding ma masking and, and side effects of vaccinations and not reporting on that at all? And what about the fact that the BBC was put under pressure by the British government to change its editorial policy? Are you aware of that? This is, a, this is not an interview about the BBC. Oh, so. you thought it wasn't? <laughs> and this, I see now why you've done Twitter Spaces. I am not a representative of the BBC's editorial policy. I want to make that clear. Let's talk about something else. We're the Behavior Panel. And I'm Scott Rouse. I'm a body language expert and analyst. And I train law enforcement in the military in interrogation and body language. And I created the number one online body language course, bodylanguagetactics.com, with Greg Hartley. Mark? I'm Mark Bowden. I'm an expert in human behavior and body language, help people all over the world to stand out, win trust, gain credibility every time they communicate, including some of the leaders of the G7. Chase. Hey, I'm Chase Hughes. Did 20 years in the U.S. military, published a number one best-selling book on behavior profiling, influence, and persuasion. And I teach those things to everybody today. You just type my name in the app store to get training. Greg. Greg Hartley, I'm a former Army interrogator, interrogation instructor, resistance interrogation instructor. I've written 10 books on body language and behavior, put together the number one body language tactics course with Scott, and I spend most of my time in business. One of those tape replays. Um, okay, and then after that, after um, you um, let go of a lot of stuff, obviously Twitter became slimmed down a lot, and then you started making some more policy decisions. One of those policy decisions was to bring Donald Trump back. He hasn't actually tweeted yet. Right. Do you expect him to come back at any point? Like, have you have you spoken to him? I haven't spoken to him. Uh, I don't know. He may or may not come back. Uh, the, but the, but the point is that uh, Twitter should be uh, a town square that or, that is uh, gives uh, equal voice to you know the the whole country and ideally the whole world. Um, it should not be a partisan politics. Uh, you know and and. The more of a partisan politics that are on the very far left of the spectrum. San Francisco Berkeley politics normally is quite niche, um, but if, if Twitter effectively acted as a megaphone for a very niche regional politics and, and, and megaphone that to the world. So if in order for something to serve as a digital town square, it must uh, you know, serve all people from all political persuasions, uh, provided it's legal. Um, so. You know, close to half the country uh, voted for Trump. Uh, I wasn't one of them. I voted for Biden. Um, but nonetheless, uh, you know, free speech is meaningless unless you allow people uh, you don't like to say things you don't like. Otherwise, it's irrelevant. Um, and if at the point at which you lose uh, free speech, uh, it doesn't come back. Okay, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, this is a, a good one for us to start seeing the interviewer feeling less than comfortable. He starts off, though, doing what he normally has been doing. He's still illustrating in frame. He's pointing to illustrate. And when we say illustrators, it's punctuating words, thoughts, phrases, whatever. I always say punctuating your thoughts. He's got a longer sentence structure, and he's thinking a hard question. 
but he's already starting to bury her a little bit with this phone. As he gets to a more contentious question, he'll raise that phone. <clears throat> Wait until he gets called on the carpet and watch what he does with the phone. And hang in there. He's going to. Um, as you watch Musk, he's when he's bringing up these points about free speech and that, he's steepling, but he opens his hands and thumbs up in confidence as he answers all the importance of, of free speech. He doesn't use, use his brow very much. Musk is not high brow use and what we've seen a lot of times with people on the spectrum is they don't engage your brow a lot but he when he talks about the whole country and the whole world there's passion and there's that request for approval with his brow and that's not because i'm lying that's because i need you to understand what i'm saying he also does facial illustrating when he does nonetheless i don't know what i'd even call that he draws the sides of his mouth back and does an odd kind of face but we're starting now to see what makes him him and we're seeing a very unique to him, illustrator that people around him probably adopt. Where Trump does this with the finer point, he's doing it on the top of his leg, which is just him doing the same thing. He's making his point. Um, and it doesn't come back downward. It, it doesn't come back when he's talking about the freedom of speech. If you lose it, he's got a downward tone and he's telling and he leans in clearly to send his message. As he's doing every one of these things, He's asking, do you understand the elements? You'll listen to his voice a little because the elements of what he's doing, go back to that last video, he's starting to say these are admissible elements of the argument. And he's one of those kind of people that the last thing you want to do is try to turn and change directions on him and once you've agreed to those things because he's going to chase you and he's going to run you down. When, when my son was around, he used to tell people that come to my house, it's okay to run out of points and facts to defend yourself. Just don't turn and run because it will get ugly if you turn and run. And that's a very much a business approach. When you run out of facts, you say, I don't know anymore. That's all I got. And when you've got a guy who has been this successful in business, forget whatever rocket science or whatever other thing he's doing, Scott. This guy is a master of business of what he's done and how what he's accomplished more than anything else. That's why he's a Tony Stark and Lex Luthor thing. He's got more money than anybody. On, well, now he doesn't. He spend more of it. But he had more money than anybody on earth and was at the top for a long time. He's more of a business guy, I think, than a techie guy. He just knows the right techie guys to bring in. Just my opinion. And he's using a lot of that business acumen to get things done. Scott, what do you got? All right. I think this is a serious and prepared delivery because he's talking about what he thinks Twitter is and what it should be from as a whole. You know, from in my heart, this is what I think Twitter is because he spent billions buying this thing. So it has to mean something to him. So I think that's why that... The, the the words he is vernacular while you while explaining that's different than everything else we've heard it's very clean it's really it's things you've heard before it's almost like those it's not quite like a a, a pitch like a purpose statement but it, it hints at that so i think he was trying not to say the purpose statement as he was saying why well, it was important that's why i think that sounds so prepared at the beginning there and then again he starts steepling his hands and he's using that classic elon musk voice um and the tones is back to his baseline. His eye contact again is is strong compared to what we've seen so far. It's been kind of loose up to this point, but now he's as he's telling what he thinks about Twitter. That's when we see it get strong because he he's just delivering something that, that he's already had uh, prepared up there and ready to go. Uh, the interviewer has a pretty good clean uh, tone and everything at this point. And one thing that I noticed about is starting to bug me to death is. He's all the time looking up and to the left before he starts talking. Then he'll look over here or when he finishes talking and looks over here. It's just it's getting on my last nerve. It's probably just some kind of a, a little tick he has that he has to do. Maybe he's thinking and he looks up that way. But it seems he's always looking up here before he says something. But that could be his his stop. You know, hang on a second because I want to say something. You know, getting to that moment and say something heavy or I'm, I'm, it's my turn and I need to think a second. I need you to see me looking away so you won't say anything. Like sort of like an um that people do that Elon Musk does um, not quite a bit but he does that a few times in here um, then he starts scratching his face as that adapter again and I think I think that just must be part of his little nervous baseline uh, because we see it so often Mark what do you got yeah, so I think Clayton tries to give an attack with the association with Trump and uh, giving him back or freeing his account. Um, Musk come back, comes back with, I haven't spoken to him. He may or may not come back. And we see a very subtle but pronounced postural bump in, uh, in Musk. I think he is, I don't think that's a positivity or optimism around 
Trump at all. I think it's a positivity that he just scored a point with him because he said, look, I, I can open up the gates to Trump, but I can't open up whether he tweets or doesn't tweet, and he hasn't tweeted. So, you know, it's a, it's a point for him in terms of free speech and lets him into his town square message, which I think you're right, uh, Scott, it's a prepared message. It's what he's come to deliver. I think it's clear from uh, from his symmetrical gestures that start happening at that point and at exactly naval level, truth plane there, that this is the message he's come to, or the first message that he's he's come to, to give. Um, he gives it really well, I think. Uh, we get uh, the BBC uh, Clayton adapting again on his on his shirt. Um, so it really, really hasn't gone his way. So scores at this point, I'm saying it's it's three one to to Musk. I, I think I think Clayton's got one in, but Musk is is way ahead uh, in the game now. And and let's see how it progresses. Uh, Chase, what do you got on this one? Yeah, you'll cover you'll cover a lot of what I had here, but. Yeah, th this is probably something I'm going to have to come up with a name for. This reporter's just nodding his way through Elon's answer to his questions and just waiting for his turn to talk. Just I waiting. That's what the name of it is. Waiting for his turn to talk. Yeah. There's no listening going on at all. And maybe we could just call it fake listening. And I think you could have stopped this, this guy mid-answer while Musk was talking and asked the reporter, what, what did Elon say? just now <laughs> i don't think he would know and what elon's referencing or when he's e referencing these berkeley politics there's an interesting eye accessing movement and eye accessing is when we move our eyes around and in our head to access information uh and is going down into his right which corresponds at about a hundred percent rate give or take to emotional processing so when somebody looks down and to the right, that's what's going on. And as an interesting side note, if you drive a Tesla, you're looking down and right to access all the information about your vehicle all the time. And that's where the designers place the information in the screen in the car. And if you have been studying behavior, you've taken a course or two of mine, you'll know why this might be a deliberate effort to place the screen there on a Tesla. One of those tape replays. Um. Okay, and then after that, after um, you um, let go of a lot of stuff, obviously Twitter became slimmed down a lot, and then you started making some more policy decisions. One of those policy decisions was to bring Donald Trump back. He hasn't actually tweeted yet. Right. Do you expect him to come back at any point? Like, have you have you spoken to him? I haven't spoke to him. Uh, I don't know. He may or may not come back. Uh, the, but the, but the point is that uh, Twitter should be uh, a town square that or, that is uh, gives. Uh, equal voice to you know the, the whole country and ideally the whole world um, it should not be a partisan politics uh, you know and and the more of a partisan politics that are on the very far left of the spectrum San Francisco Berkeley politics normally is quite niche um, but if, if Twitter effectively acted as a megaphone for a very niche regional politics and and megaphone that to the world so if in order for something to serve as a digital town square, it must, uh, you know, serve all people from all political persuasions, uh, provided it's legal. Um, so, you know, close to half the country uh, voted for Trump. Uh, I wasn't one of them. I voted for Biden. Um, but nonetheless, uh, you know, free speech is meaningless unless you allow people uh, you don't like to say things you don't like. Otherwise, it's irrelevant. Um, and if at the point where you lose uh, free speech, uh, it doesn't come back. Um, what's the most difficult thing you've had to do? What's the hardest thing you've had to do? In my whole life? Or? In the last six months. Oh. We're, talking about, <laughs> we're talking about the last six months as you as, as Twitter boss here. And twi Twitter owner. Um, well, shutting down uh, our one of our service centers was, was quite difficult because it turns out there were um, I, I thought the service centers were redundant, uh, but uh, there were, in fact, a lot of things that were hard-coded to this one service center. And so when we shut it down, we actually, uh, it was quite catastrophic. We lost a lot of functionality, in which we sort of really rushed to put it back. When was that? 
And that was around late December, Jan early January. So that, that was the biggest sort of, I'm, I'm worried here. Big, biggest crisis, yeah. Yeah. And what about hard in terms of emotional? I mean, I mean, is letting go. I mean, what, what were the current the, step, the levels of staff, and what are they now? Um, I think we're um, around fifteen hundred people at this point, and there was I think seventy eight hundred. What was that? Sorry, set, I, I think it was around just under eight thousand, and 8, we're about fifteen hundred right now. Okay, and it, it, has it been hard letting that, that many people go? Yeah. Not fun at all. It's painful. I mean, I guess in in what way do you do you feel like you need to speak to people when they when when they leave? Or I mean, it's not physically possible to speak to that many people. Mm. Mm. Has, has that? I mean, you talked about that being the most technical bit. Is that has has that been sort of the hardest thing emotionally, or is, is it? Is it's one of the hardest things, certainly. Yeah. Yeah. You're <laughs> good. Okay. Okay. Hey man, okay. All right, well I'll go first. <laughs> I won't be able to this time. <laughs> um, all right, Chase, what do you got? Uh, Elon is just consistently answering these questions, and this this guy isn't listening whatsoever. This is one of the worst interviewers I've seen in a while. Maybe needs some more training. Maybe he's just in over his head. Maybe he had a rough night. I don't know. Maybe they got those chairs from the best Western. I don't know. But uh, there's no dialogue. It's throughout, in, in most good interviewers, even if they're hard-nosed and hard line, there's dialogue back and forth. And not just, I need to get back to my phone so I can see the next question here. And the only interesting point here that really shines a light on this according to me anyway, is where the reporter guy asks about whether Elon thinks about uh, talking to these people as they leave uh, the company again. Elon reminds him of the fact that it's not physically possible. Like, it's just a fact. The reporter's response is just a grunt. Uh, like that. Not even processing the response from Elon whatsoever. Uh, and I think that sums up the entire thing. Like there's facts and well thought out reasoning and zero uh, reflection uh, in the reporter. There is zero dialogue. He has not really consciously processed uh, almost every single thing that Elon has said. Uh, Scott, what do you got? All right. Yeah, I agree with you 100% on all that. And I think at, at this point, we're getting back to the normal baseline for Elon that we saw at the beginning. So his illustrators are low. They're not as 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 big, and and they don't move as fast as they were before. They've slowed down a little bit, and his voice tone is lower, and so is his voice volume. And the big change up though is that, that clasped hands, his clasped hands that that come in. And I think that's more because he's when when he's talking about you're talking about firing people, you're talking about letting people off, all those kind of things. I think that's that's a little stressful for him. Um, his feet move forward from under the chair. I think the retreat is over from the fuss he was having uh, earlier. And, the, and then the interviewer says, is it hard letting that many people go? And he immediately says, yeah. And then we see that little shoulder thing. And, and the shoulder pulls forward. It's not a shrug. It doesn't go up. It pulls forward. I think it's because it was stressful for him. And you know how you feel um, stress in your back. I think oh, it hurts right here. I think that was actually stressful for him. Probably not all of them because I'm sure there are some people that wouldn't in this situation would need to be let go but some people that didn't and i'm sure he knew that that there was going to be fallout from that of quote unquote innocent people who aren't going to have jobs and weren't going to be able to to you know feed their families and all that kind of thing so then after the question um do you feel you should talk to people instead of talking to people when they're fired you're right chase he said no it's it's physically impossible and after he does that that's the biggest head nod we see so far that confirmation nod which is which is one of his like i was saying earlier it's how he finishes his statement says i'm finished or i'm done right there greg what do you got yeah i don't have a whole lot on this one there are just a handful of things this chase i think this guy sees this as an assignment not as a get to a have to not get to because if he wanted i think if somebody told me he's a tech editor or a tech reporter yeah holy jeez who are you talking to simply the most profound thinker in tech and forever 
among people. Now, people are going to light me up about that and say he's not profound. Look, he's going to put people on Mars. And there's a plan. There's actually activity going on to do it, not a bunch of talk. And in 2028 or in 3030, we're going to do it. So here's a guy that if you look, if I were talking to the guy to have different questions than this, not gotchas, why did you let all these people go? Well, there's clear business reasons that, you know, they're, they're burning through money so quickly they had four months to live. And he goes into that. He's clear. He's very clear in his approach. I've read that often people who have autism are very literal in their understanding of questions. And that probably is exactly how he responded. Well, I can't. Not, I would like to have and, but it's just physically impossible. <clears throat> I'm gonna stop right here and just say the last, my favorite thing in this entire piece, this tells you the guy didn't do his homework, is he tries to use silence to get the guy to talk more to a guy who can't read social cues. That tells you he didn't prepare well. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, look, if you've made it this far, congratulations, because it's now just exhausting watching this interview because I think you're right, Chase, it, it is, it's terrible. It's just embarrassingly terrible. I think now the interview, you see him kind of scratching, not only at his stomach area, but a little further down, more towards his crotch. He's now kind of, I think, feigning disinterest in what should be a potentially extraordinary interview. Um, because what an opportunity to have to have Musk, whatever you think of him, what an opportunity to be able to question this person. Um, now, here's the problem is that is that well, one of the problems is that the interviewer keeps looking at his list of questions. And I'll tell you this for certain. You won't get information out of people with a list of questions. It just won't happen. Why is that the case? It's because human beings and human behavior and psychology is complex. It's not simple. It's not even complicated. It's complex, which means it's a constant dance between you and the other person and all the actions and interactions and past interactions and potential future interactions that are going on. It is fascinatingly complex. Complex, and therefore, a linear set of questions is a good start. I'm not saying don't have a bunch of questions, really good start. But if you're really playing into the complexity of it, you will leave those questions at some point, and he doesn't seem to be able to. In fact, later on in this interview, he can't even remember whether he asked him the regret question or not. So he's, he's lost even in his own list. It's a complete uh, disaster. You know, if you can learn anything from this, just understand it's complex. You can't come. You can come with, with a simple strategy, but know that you're gonna give up your strategy once the complexity starts and get dancing with that person. And that would be such a fascinating interview, which unfortunately we don't get to see here. That's all I got on this one. One of those tape replays. The Tesla stock sales caused the Tesla stock to plummet. Uh, which was not good. Do you think those two were connected? Well, the, the, the people couldn't, couldn't parse the difference between I'm selling Tesla stock because I have, I've lost faith in Tesla, which I haven't, or that it's desperately needed for Twitter.